I'd like to introduce Louis Gino Marchetti Jr., who is the interview today, March 2nd, 2023, at the National Bar Association, 150 Fourth Avenue, Suite 1350 in Nashville, Tennessee. My name is Carol McCoy, and I will be doing the interview. Gino, you have been very good to prepare exceptionally well for this interview. And I'd like you to start by talking about your family and the history, about your mother and your father and where you grew up. Well, the preparation comes from my freshman football coach at Vanderbilt, where he brought us into the locker room on Sunday evenings to remind us that we shouldn't be homesick. Of course, I had walked across the street to Vanderbilt University, but he said, always remember the five Ps. We all scratched our head. He says, proper preparation prevents poor performance. So anyway, I've got that now uh, a needle pointed above my uh, uh, desk uh, in my office. So um, we can give Coach Cope credit for uh, being prepared. Um, mom and dad. Um, dad was a Nashville native. Um, his father uh, came here from New York uh, by way of... Um, Badga, Italy, just north of Lucca, uh, in 1920. Uh, Grandpa became a citizen in 1933. Uh, Dad was born in 31, so he was born to an Italian citizen, which allowed us to receive our Italian citizenship on the 100th anniversary of um, Gino um, coming to uh, his birth in 2005. Um, he worked at the old Candyland uh, there by Centennial Park on West End, which I think may now be, uh, uh, it was Vandyland for a while. Which uh, was but, a meet and three? A uh, meet and three. Mm -hmm. And a soda shop and everything. They had one down on Church Street as well. Um, gosh, uh, Greek family. Um, and my other grandfather, Harvey Miles, uh, from St. Louis, uh, was a manager of the Hales Drugstore which was right across the street, which is now where the old Panera Bread uh, now closed is, um, corner of 29th, I guess it is, and uh, West End. And so mom would walk across the street to get a milkshake, and that's where she met dad. And uh, let's see, about 70 years ago, uh, they married. So, uh, and I popped along about... Uh, Let's see, 11 months after their marriage uh, in October of 1950. So, well, when was your dad born? You said 31. Uh, do you remember? Uh, yes, 1931. Uh, and he passed away about seven years ago. And um, they all spoke Italian growing up. Uh, the Italians had a little section uh, down here at the foot of Capitol Hill on Gay Street. Uh, we grew up in my grandmother's house so where the Holiday Inn Vanderbilt is, uh, behind the Holiday Inn Vanderbilt, which at that time was the Hippodrome, which was a skate rink and a place where live studio wrestling took place on uh, Tuesday or Tuesday evening. So uh, Centennial Park was our playground and uh, went to Cathedral Grade School uh, down on 20th. Uh, so we would be dropped off in the morning uh, and we would walk home. And we knew everybody. And uh, being what the old, what did your dad do? He was in the Air Force for two years, uh, and then uh, he became a civilian employee for the Air National Guard at Berry Field. And that was when the Air National Guard on Murfreesboro Road there at Berry Field um, had jets, and they were reconnaissance F eighty four, similar to the one that's in the uh, park. Uh, Centennial Park, that's an F-86, a fighter. These were our F-84s, reconnaissance and fighters. Um, and dad was in the photograph uh, uh, section. Um, and interesting, a lot of the uh, uh, pilots uh, were attorneys. I uh, see John Toon's name on the wall here. John was one of dad's uh, pilots. Um, and some of the generals uh, work for Genesco. And they would take the cameras out of the extended nose of the jet uh, and would load it with their sample shoes. And so they would, using 
<laughs> the RF-84, they would make their flights um, and go to shoe shows with, uh, that's hard to say, uh, shoe shows um, with the nose of their fighter uh, instead of with cameras uh, loaded with shoes. So anyway, it was fun. And then they later switched to uh, transports and Ed became a uh, loadmaster uh, on C-124s, C-97s, and then C-130s uh, and literally flew all over the world, uh, Vietnam, Japan, Etc. Um, I see the green eggs in the various stores, the hibachi pots. Uh, Dad would bring those back five or six at a time. They were like $15 or $20. And so we were using hibachi pots, gosh, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. Well, so, oh, yeah. Then they became. He did that for 34 years. And then he went to work for the sheriff's department. Um, serving process, and that's when they were all in khaki pants and blue blazers and ties, and all in their 50s and 60s, um, until I think one of the uh, deputies serving a restraining order uh, was shot, um, uh, and so then they said, well, you need to get training, uh, and then they put him in Smokey the Bear type outfits with guns and everything. And that's when our office is at One Union Street. And dad came in one day to serve me process uh, as an agent for process, not me personally as a defendant, not for wood. <laughs> and um, I glanced down to his left and he looked down and he says, what? I says, your holster. Oh gosh, I left my gun at home. So anyway, I said, dad, thank you. yeah, I said, dad, maybe this isn't what you need to do. So long story short, he retired. He was 67, 68 years old. Um, I was in the office one day and my mother called. She never called the office. Uh, I said, yeah, mom, what's what's wrong? She says, do you have anything dad can do? I said, what do you mean do? He says, she uh, needs to get him out of he's, the back. he's been home for three weeks. He says he's taken apart about half the appliances and about half of them work once he put them back together. I said, well, we use some people from Cumberland Heights with Dick Taylor uh, working out there and helping some of these guys. I said, but he just got his second DUI. So I don't think that guy's going to be working for us anymore. So does he want to be our runner? And um, he became our runner for 16 years. And I was down in Wilson County uh, one day for a hearing and came in uh, to see the clerk. And I asked, I said, is Margie in? And she says, let me check, Gino. She's uh, on the telephone. And she walked around. She says, oh, she's off. So she walked around and says, uh, Margie, Gino Marchetti's here. Oh, send him in. I just love that man. My dad's name is Gino as well. And so I came around feeling pretty good. She said, oh, it's you. I said, what do you mean it's me? You sound disappointed. Well, I am. Your dad, he's the best. He sits in that chair and we tell stories and whatnot. I said, no longer he's gone for three hours when he should be gone for 30 minutes. You do anything to him, you'll never get a hearing. So anyway, that was dad. And he, um, mom was, she worked a lot harder than any of us. Um, and those of nine. Um, and when and where was she born? Uh, she was born 1928, uh, Centre, Illinois. Uh, so she was a Yankee. And um, she was she was delightful. She was born in Illinois. Illinois, not Springfield, Missouri. Oh, it may be Springfield, Missouri. I thought it was Illinois. It's a different woman. Oh gosh, no, my gosh, mercy sakes, a lot. Um, <laughs> no, sp um, that's a typo. I am so so sorry. Uh, it was Centre, Illinois. Okay. Um, I apologize. Um, and that and you were talking about how hard she worked and why was that? Oh, uh, she was the mother of nine wonderful children, mm -hmm. and I was the oldest of them. Uh, six boys and three girls. Um, Not only did she work hard, she was a saint. Oh, she absolutely, absolutely was. But she had all the finances uh, for the family. Um, in fact, she received a call one day from Commerce Union Bank on Seventeenth and Church. Miss Marchetti, I'm so sorry. But this is what? She says, uh, uh, I think we have a check that's been forged, uh, but we went ahead and cashed it. She said, oh my gosh, well, I 
be right down. So she didn't drive until I think I was a freshman in high school. Um, so we took the bus down. I went with her and went in and they handed her the check and mom started giggling. And she says, what, what? She says, that's my husband's signature. Mom had always endorsed his checks and made the deposit. So dad was bold enough to deposit a check by signing his own name instead of mom signing it. So they knew it was a forgery. So uh, anyway, um, and she was the wife. that she worked really, really hard with these nine children, but did she do anything else? Yes, she did. Uh, once the baby, Mary, who was 15 years my junior, uh, started school, uh, mom became a patrol mother. Um, at Father Ryan High School, and it was on Elston Street, uh, at Aiken and Cavert, um, uh, up on Fairfax, and then later on at Franklin Road Academy. And so she did that for 25 years, um, I guess. Well, you were telling us about growing up right next to Centennial Park behind what is now the, the Vanderbilt Holiday Inn, I think. Yeah. The, at one time, as you said, it was the... Um, Hippodrome. Hippodrome. Mm -hmm. That must have been fascinating. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, we lived in the park uh, during the summertime. Um, in fact, driving here, my office now is on Poston, uh, which is about three blocks from Vanderbilt Holiday Inn. And so we cut through Rosa Parks Boulevard to uh, get here to come up Charlotte. And uh, the paralegal that was bringing me, um, I said, oh, gosh, there's where I took swimming lessons. She said, what are you talking about? I said, that was a swimming pool. What was? I said, the art center was a swimming pool. We took lessons there, and we came to swim there one day, and there was a big padlock on it uh, because of um, uh, the blacks wanted to swim in Centennial Park, and rather than allowing that, they filled it in and turned it into uh, an art center. So um, anyway, it's... Uh, so where did you go to grade school? Went to grade school at Cathedral of the Incarnation, uh, down between 20th and 21st on West End. Where the cathedral is now. Where the cathedral is now. Um, the yeah. building immediately adjacent to the cathedral, to the right, uh, was our school. Uh, and we had a girls high school. Uh, which previously was Father Ryan High School until 1929 when Father Ryan was built on Elson Place. Uh, then the boys moved there and that remained a uh, girls' school. Uh, we had two grades in each class, so first and second, third and fourth, fifth and sixth, seventh and eighth. We had four classrooms right in a row. Mm -hmm. Lots of nuns, Sister Mae Borgia, Sister Mae Edgar, <laughs> Sister Mae Christopher, uh, Sister Mary Malachy, who was direct from uh, Dublin, um, one day I was um, out in the hall picking my coat up. I was in third grade, and Sister Mary Christopher, who had seventh and eighth grade, um, we had made pinwheels that day, and I had my pinwheel stuck in my racer, and I was doing that out in the hall and getting my coat. I wasn't that late, and Sister Mary Christopher said, uh, young man, do you have a classroom? And I just seen the Three Stooges the afternoon before, and the response to her question was yowza bowza. And so, for whatever reason, uh, <laughs> Sister Mary Christopher, I thought it'd be cute to say yowza bowza. What did you say to me? I said, uh, yes, sister. No, you didn't. She literally drug me down two floors by my ear. <laughs> so, into Sister Mary Delellis, uh, our principal, who was about six foot eight, at least she appeared that day to be six foot eight. Uh, so anyway, I never said y'all's about her again. So anyway. I uh, bet you never did. I never did. And we had the old Anchor Motel immediately across and across the uh, street was the Allen Motel. And um, Vanderbilt University was our, our playground as well. So uh, did you ever have any little jobs that you did while you were growing up? Uh, grass cutting was probably uh, most of what uh, what we did, starting when I was probably 10 or 12 years old. And what did you charge? Uh, probably a dollar a yard, maybe. Uh, I remember one lady gave us 65 cents, and I came home and I gave it to mom. She said, you take that back to her. We don't need that kind of 
we were underpaid. So she said she's not going to take it. So I said, Mom, it's 65 cents. So anyway. Well, uh, tell me a little bit about um, what kind of odd jobs you had during high school. High school, uh, grass cutting, uh, some, some helping out with construction, uh, painting. I remember painting an entire house on River Road uh, when I was a sophomore in high school, and I think I got a hundred dollars. Uh, did not buy the paint. It was my aunt. And um, so that was good. Uh, then in between my sophomore or junior and senior year, um, Metro paid me to be in charge of the boys at St. Mary's Orphanage uh, on a White Bridge Road. Um, and there was a, another young woman who was in charge of the girls. And so we spent that summer um uh, running around behind St. Mary's Orphanage at that time and before Target and Lion's Head and all those. Uh, it was just a big field. The VA hospital was where Target and all those places are. Um, but the Sisters of St. Joseph ran the orphanage. And if we went and picked enough blackberries and brought them back to Sister Mary Michael, uh, she would have a blueberry cobbler or blackberry cobbler for us uh, for our snack that afternoon. So uh, anyway, that was uh, that was fun for that time. And then uh, finished up and graduated in what spring of 1969. So and what kind of sports or activities did you have besides your job? Uh, football um, at Father Ryan and coming from Cathedral, uh, we did not have enough boys to have a football team. Uh, but begin strange. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But beginning in the sixth grade, uh, we were able to use the boys from St. Mary's Orphanage. Um, gosh, they were tough. Um, Ringers. Oh, babe, yeah, exactly. So we were, we were merged. We were merged with them. And I think we won the championship for eighth grade <laughs> year with these guys. They were tough. Um, and I remember the Ham brothers in particular. Johnny Rowanzak uh, was another one. Uh, and we played out the Knights Columbus, uh, out of uh, by St. Thomas uh, uh, West now. Um, interesting, uh, my role as the athletic director for these uh, yeah. 10 boys, I guess, and had uh, three. Uh, uh, kids who were black, and we would go over to the Knights of Columbus, uh, our Catholic men's organization, uh, to swim. And we did that for about three weeks, and I was walking over there one day with our guys, and because we'd walk across the railroad tracks uh, because to get across the creek, uh, which was fun in and of itself. And uh, Mr. Griffith, who managed the club, uh, called me over and says, uh, yes, sir. He says, uh, We've had some complaints. I said, about, what? about it being too crowded. I said, what too crowded? The pool bringing these boys over. I said, there's nobody here, Mr. Griffin. And it was because of my three um, kids. And so dad called the bishop and said, uh, Bishop, I just want to let you know what's going on. He says, oh, man, yeah, do you know what? He says, uh, and he told him what happened. He said, oh. And so the bishop went to the Knights of Columbus and says, you have a choice. You either let these boys continue him or no more slot machines. They had slot machines in the, in the club. No, house. they didn't have slot yes, machines. Yes, they had slot machines in the club. I think that comes house. from bingo. Now, I think it does. It's a Catholic tradition. So anyway, if so they decided it would be better to let my boys swim than it they would give up to, the slot machines. to give up the uh, give up the slot machine. So well, uh, you, you and, did hint that you sold cokes at the Vanderbilt. Oh yeah. Games. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah I forgot about, about that. Um yeah, we literally were in the shadow of Vanderbilt Stadium and the kids from boys uh, from TPS, Tennessee Preparatory School, back then the reform school. Um, they would drop them off on what's now just Neely Boulevard. Uh, McGugan Center was not there then. And so my brother Tony and I, who's one year younger, we'd walk in and they'd get off the bus and we'd merge in with them off the bus and go in and they'd just give us our tray of Cokes. 
And so we would sell Cokes during the Vanderbilt uh, football games. Um, and you always look for the guy who was ordering a 7-Up, which was about the color of this table, which means he may have been helping himself to some Jim Beam or Jack Daniels because they were the best tippers. So anyway, <laughs> so yeah, we did that for, gosh, uh, three or four football seasons. So I got to see a lot of SEC football. Um, selling the Cokes. And now we, if we made enough money, uh, we just set the Cokes down and watch uh, watch the rest of the game. So, so how did you fun. decide where you were going to go to college? Um, for whatever reason, um, several schools thought I was, uh, had some talent in football and uh, had several offers uh, from SEC schools, Notre Dame and some other schools. And um, always loved Vanderbilt, uh, grew up, as I said, in the shadow. And so uh, decided to go to Vanderbilt to play football. And uh, that was back in the days when you had a freshman team that was separate from the varsity. Uh, and so we would play our five or six games. Um, and interesting, my wife's uncle had a sporting goods store in Oxford, Mississippi. And he and Archie Manning saw each other all the time. And he tried and tried and tried to get Jeannie, my now wife, his niece, to date Archie Manning. So, <laughs> so one day I remarked, I said, Oh, that would have been neat. She says, What are you talking about? I said, If you and Archie got married, he says, then we wouldn't have our children. I went, Oh, yeah, you're wrong. Okay. So, but I think all the ball games I'd get into. So, anyway, anyway. That would be a very strange. It would. It, it it would it, it would it would it would it would um and Shirley Jeannie's uh, aunt in Oxford uh, worked in a bookstore and his young lawyer would come in there uh, with his books and she would take them and set them on the counter and try to sell them uh, that young lawyer's name was John Grisham so we have uh, a time to kill signed by uh, John and. Uh, his other one, the firm. Um, <laughs> both of those to to Shirley. You know. Well, I don't want to jump ahead too yeah. far, but tell me if you recall any favorite teachers, people that made an influence in your studies, what you majored in. Gosh, um, maybe I you? really loved all my nuns um, in grade school, except Sister Mary Christopher drug me down those two flights of steps. Sister um, Mary Cleopas was mine. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh um high school father fleming uh, bill fleming he was um i had him for uh, history all four years uh, ancient history 612 old Nineveh. it's the <laughs> first year i don't care what you remember but on your deathbed i want you to remember 612 old Nineveh. so and that actually came up uh, a couple of weeks ago. The Assyrian Empire, it's only 612, all Nineveh. Really? How'd you know that? Oh, Father Fleming. That's right, Father, Father Bill, uh, who was super and had that bad stutter, God bless him, uh, but just was delightful. Just was delightful. I really, really liked it. So, favorite professors in college? Uh, Dewey Grantham was my. Um, history advisor. I was a history major and economics uh, minor. Uh, really enjoyed uh, enjoyed him. Uh, ben Bolch was our statistics teacher. Uh, I liked him, but my favorite was Howard Borman. Um, he was my East Asian studies uh, professor. Uh, and he lived on Hoods Hill Road, and each spring and fall, he would have the basketball players and the football players come over, and he was the adjutant for, or executive officer for Vinegar, Vinegar Joe Stilwell during the World War II in the Pacific, and so he would tell stories about World War II, because, gosh, we were, what, 25 years post-ending um, the World War II, so it was still relatively new, and he had all types of stories, and he was just a delightful, delightful Delightful person could talk to him anytime. So, I well, really... while you were in college, 
advice. How would you describe your study habits and what activities you participate in? Uh, study habits. Um, being on the football team, uh, you had breakfast between 6.15 and 7 o'clock. Did you live on campus? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> in the new Carmichael Towers. Uh, uh, back then. Well, <laughs> it's long gone. Rinky was uh, where I was as a freshman, and they would put three football players. They would spread us out on the floor um, because they had them all on one floor, but apparently they did a lot of damage one year, so they, they spread us out. Um, freshman year, and then we were on the third, fourth, and fifth floor of uh, our Carmichael Towers, uh, so they would keep us all there, uh, so they could have bed check, et cetera, and so forth. So breakfast was 6.15 to uh, 7 o'clock. Um, I remember freshman year, my Western Civ course, um, it was Tuesdays, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays um, at 9 o'clock uh, in Old Furman, uh, but then our individual eight or 10 member session was on Saturday morning at eight o'clock, uh, which was great unless you had a ball game out of town or if you had a ball game at one o'clock uh, that afternoon or three o'clock that afternoon, but um, we managed. Um, so it's very structured. Oh yes, 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 yes. And my grades were a lot better during football season because I had to train that. Uh, because not only would you uh, you have classes, you'd have breakfast, classes, uh, train table for lunch. Um, you'd go down for film session at two o'clock. Practice would start at 3.30. Practice would end about six. You go back to the training table and you get back to your dorm, you know, seven o'clock uh, thereabouts. Um, I had a geology lab on Mondays and Wednesday afternoons. And so I didn't get to practice till about four o'clock. And my line coach asked me, uh, you know, Marquette, where are you? He said, well, I've got a lab coach. I've got to go to that. Lab, yes, that's recruiting talk. I said, Sorry? He says, that's scholar athlete. That's recruiting talk. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. Well, we're at the Harvard of the South, et cetera, and so forth. Ah, I said, just put those books under your pillow. And it'll, it'll soak in. So. Well, anyway, <laughs> that's right. Well, that was the same coach, uh, Ciro Cardelli out of uh, New Jersey, tied in, was running a pass route, looked back to catch a ball, ran smack dab into the uh, metal goalpost, got a concussion, knocked himself out. Trainers went over, helped him up. He was kind of stumbling around, and the same coach yelled, Off the field, you're hurting morale. <laughs> okay. Good for him. Good for him. So anyway. So what about activities? Did you join any fraternities? Uh, yes, had uh, Kappa Sig uh, fraternity um, for what little time we had um, uh, outside of uh, football. Um, but you never lived in a, a fraternity house. Never lived in a fraternity house. Uh, in fact, the only people who lived in Vanderbilt in a fraternity house were uh, the officers. Um, so anyway, it was um, it was fun. Uh, Branscombe Quadrangle was right across the street, and uh, there was a report one night to the police, um, the campus police, uh, and back then it was Mr. Baltz, who was about 70 years old, drove a little meter maid scooter, uh, and I think they had one or two other policemen, um, but we would climb Branscombe Quad's trellis to talk to the girls. And apparently there was a report of that. And Did you ever do that? Uh, you don't well, have to say that. <laughs> one, one, one night uh, we heard uh, Mr. Baltz with his little boop boop on his uh, uh, meter maid scooter coming. So we shinny down from the third floor back to the attorney office. He came over and says, boys, were y'all up on that trellis? He says, no, sir, Officer Baltz, we were not. He said, let me see your hands. Or hands for what? Or let me see. Of course, it would cover the whitewash from the Texas. Of course, don't do that anymore. I said, okay, we'll, we'll behave. But I think we did it one other time. So, yeah. Well, let me ask you about your summers, uh, your sophomore and your junior years. Um, did you have any? I think freshman and sophomore years, what were your activities? Like? Um, I sold ads for the Vanderbilt football program. And talk about sales. 
Uh, I think maybe on average 10,000 people would come to a Vanderbilt football game uh, during those times. Uh, but it was fun. I got to meet a lot of uh, business people, got to meet uh, a lot of uh, uh, famous alumni uh, and the like, and um, got someone to tell me uh, on the freshman year, Vanderbilt's football field was grass and had a cinder track going around it. Um, and there was a plaque right in the middle, which was a quote from Grantman Rice, famous sports writer. Right. Uh, when the great score comes to mark against your name, who well, ask not whether you won or lost, but how you played the game. And which sounded like a wonderful thing for young people, uh, but really wasn't inspirational <laughs> if you were going to play Alabama or, or Georgia. Because um, winning was important. Winning was important. In fact, I remembered our spring game, the uh, black and gold game. Um, we were in the uh, visitors' locker room, the black team, uh, and the gold team was in the other one. Waxhill Green, uh, who wrote for the banner, um, was our coach. And John Bibb, who wrote for the Tennessean, was the honorary coach for the other team. And I remember Waxhill giving us a pep talk. Somebody said, well, uh, coach, you going to give us a pep talk? He says, boys, we got tradition on our side. You know, well, what do you mean? Says there's been more winners come out of this visitors' locker room than they have out of that locker room over the past fifty odd years. So anyway, a compliment there. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So that was fun. So how did you supplement your selling of the programs as you moved through the, your college years? Um, coach came to me one day, and that was one good thing. The coaches, I, I love them. Uh, Charlie Bradshaw was my line coach. Uh, my in uh, my sophomore year. Uh, and he had Rudyard Kipling's If poem on the wall. Um, and I've used that 10 million times. If you can keep your head on all about your losing theirs and blaming it on you. Um, in fact, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a uh, lawyer's meeting and Yusef Salam was our speaker. He was one of the five young men uh, in the Central Park jogger case, 1989, arrested in prison for 13 years. And I was fortunate enough to have breakfast with him. Uh, and he uh, gave a little talk and we were sitting down. And I said, uh, one of my favorite poems is If, and if you keep your head and all that, you blame it on you. He says, but you keep your head. And he said, uh, I remember the words of Nelson Mandela when he came out of prison. I said, those being, he says, uh, he was asked if he was ever anger Angry and bitter. He says, um, anger, yes. Bitter, no. Bitterness is like poison you drink thinking it's going to hurt your enemy. So, whoa. so anyway, that's, that's a lesson. If, if, oh gosh, and just delightful, delightful, well, delightful. Person. How did you end up working for uh, the construction company, Little Brothers? Oh, yeah. Um, Next door neighbor to my mom uh, worked for Little Brothers. He was a plasterer. And he said, uh, uh, Betty, my mom, any of your boys want to work construction? And I was loading trucks at roadway at that particular time. And we were casual labor. So they would call you at 2 a.m. in the morning uh, or 1 a.m. in the morning. And a couple of times I'd worked eight on a Sunday morning until three o'clock, my eight hours, so I wouldn't get overtime, um, be off eight hours and then get called back for eight hours. So you work all night, get off at eight o'clock and then get a couple hours sleep and call again. But they paid about six and a half bucks an hour. But Little Brothers paid, uh, I think about 8.50 an hour. So, and one of my jobs was the federal courthouse, uh, not the Estes Key Falker, but the quote new annex back then uh working uh, with them and so it was fun later on and now and yeah. now there's a new courthouse <laughs> and now there's a, a new, new courthouse and so that's the old courthouse so one thing i didn't do when i was asking is the full name of your mother we don't want to forget oh that. mary elizabeth eileen miles and where did she come from uh she was from centralia illinois but 
Oh. You fed your grandfather from Italy on your father's side. Mm -hmm. Where did your Oh, father... she's Irish. Irish, Irish. How did I not know that? <laughs> Uh, her uh, her mother was one of six girls, um, Maroney, Eileen Maroney. I remember my grandmother, who came and lived with us for the last 20 years of her life. Uh, she was our St. Louis grandma. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we would go meet her at the Greyhound bus station downtown or the Trailways bus station downtown. One time she flew. Um, and. The old airport was on Briley Parkway. And first time I ever saw color television was in the waiting area there at the, uh, at the old airport. Yeah, it had two glass doors. You'd walk out uh, on a sidewalk into a yard, and there was a chain link fence about three feet high. And then there were the airplanes, and they smoked the thing up. And <laughs> just, just walk out. So I do remember our St. Louis grandma, Eileen. Coming down. So well, let yeah. me, we're, we're into uh, college a little bit, but let me ask about community existing at that time. And one question is the military service, and then the other is community work. And you had given me a little bit of a summary of what you had done um, with regards to, I think you said, no military service. No military service. But you had a lot of community work. We did. Um, on the military service, they had the drawing of your birth date and for the draft. For the draft, uh, it was the fall of 1969. What was happening? And Vietnam was in full swing. Uh, we were at the training table, and someone had a television with the numbers being pulled. Uh, long story short, mine was 166, I believe. Uh, so I was good. But I remember Ken Stone, I think his birthday was September 1st. He was number one. And Ken worked really hard to stay in school. He was our defensive back. And later went on to play for the Washington Redskins and uh, uh, and the uh, uh, Dallas Cowboys. So uh, anyway, Kenny uh, lived down in Florida, spoke with him, gosh, a month ago. And, and the football team was somewhat of Turning as well. Sure. I mean, we bled and died and all that other. We have stayed in touch. Good stuff. And we have. We have. Uh, uh, so it was fun. So, was, what type of community work did you do during that time? Um, I worked a lot with uh, youth, uh, Catholic Church, uh, with our Catholic uh, youth. Uh, we had a place called the Sugar Shack, which then Father Zorolic, Stephen Zorolic's dad. Uh, was one of my favorite, favorite, favorite teachers. I forgot him when you were asking about favorite teachers um, at Father Ryan High School. Um, he was just a delight. So, how did Father Zrelik get to be a priest that he's still staff? He was a priest. In fact, five of the priests who taught me at Father Ryan High School later uh, asked to be laicized. Um, and two of them, Father Mike John, Father Ed Johnson, Father Mike Johnson's older brother, uh, oh. and Father Zralik married women who were nuns. I did not know. That. And they uh, came out of uh, the convent, um, but went through all the proper processes, et cetera, and did the exact same thing, if not more priestly functions, uh, after they stopped being priests. Um, of course, Father Zralik died. <laughs> Had worked with a lot of uh, Thai Nashville together and those sorts of things. I think he may have been a probation officer. Um, and um, Ed Johnson, uh, he worked with the Red Cross and other charitable uh, organizations. So, uh, well, what it was about just the work with the Ladies of Charity? Oh, gosh. Um, of course, the Ladies of Charity uh, delivered food baskets and all those sorts of things. Um, helping those who aren't as advantaged as many of us are. And mom worked there up until, gosh, five years ago. Mom just turned 95 uh, two Sundays ago. Now, congratulations to her. We made her strong. So, um, but uh, working with that, uh, CWO uh, a lot was what uh, we worked with. Um, Little League football coach, uh, Little League baseball coach, um, 
I was the commissioner for parochial league. Um, so anyway, it was it was fun. It was fun. Had a great this, life. this is a, one of the points they ask is about the impact of major social, economic, and political events. And you're talking now about the, the late 60s. Mm -hmm. And how would you summarize what was going on at that time? I think you uh, Flower Power, um, Haight Ashbury, uh, Woodstock, um, protest on campus. Um, I think he said Stokely Carmichael. Uh, Stokely Carmichael came and spoke at uh, Vanderbilt, uh, Bucep. Um, gosh, I think Bill Kunstler came, if wow. I'm not mistaken. Uh, he was and, a lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. In fact, he was. Uh, the uh, Central Park Five. Uh, he was there, their attorney, um, and kept pushing, 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 finally get their uh, innocence proved. Um, there were protests on campus against the war. Uh, people in black uh, robes carrying, you know, old coffins around. Um, 68. 68, 69, 68 Democratic Convention in Chicago and the riots. Uh, there, uh, my wife went to Kentucky her first two years, and um, they burned down the ROTC building um, at uh, UK, uh, Kent State. Um, those students a lot of protests killed at there. The ROTC centers oh, across. everywhere, everywhere. Uh, so who did you pick? What you were going to do after you finished college? My father-in-law was an orthopedic surgeon, and Jeannie. Uh, my wife, she went to St. Cecilia Academy, which was all girls. I was at Father Ryan, which was all boys. And once a month, um, the young women from St. Cecilia would come to Father Ryan uh, for us to study great books. Uh, we would study the classics. And it was Machiavelli's The Prince uh, we were studying uh, when Jean, uh, I had the nerve to ask her out because uh, she was from this social status and I was from this social status. So, but I worked up the, you know, the energy and the courage to ask and she said, oh, I can't. I went, oh, well, I gave it a shot. And uh, it was the father-daughter dance for St. Cecilia. So I just thought that was an excuse. She didn't want anything to do with me. Uh, and this was, and then uh, graduation, one of my friends, uh, Stanley Belcher, um, who later on went to the Naval Academy and on with a great career at the Navy, um, said, do you want to go to St. Cecilia graduation? I said, no, why? <laughs> he, says, he was dating uh, uh, Loretta Balls. And he said, well, I'm going to thank you. Why don't you come? I said, okay, fine. So I went with him, and the plot was to match Jeannie and I up. So, oh. so we matched up and uh, dated that summer, and then she went away to... Uh, Kentucky. Uh, I remember my sophomore year, uh, I was starting uh, against an All-American for Kentucky football. And after Kentucky, we had a bye, then we played UT. Um, and I remember going in to ask Coach Pace, um, our then head coach, and said, uh, Coach, uh, any chance I could stay over? Because we wouldn't practice that following Monday with a bye. Any chance I could stay over and visit my girlfriend? He says, I can't believe your game. Mine's not on the game. I said, it's on the game. I've got Dave Roller across from me. He's an All-American three times or something like that. Yes, I'm focused. I'm just asking. He says, all right, if you win, if we win, you and Mark Reed, a defensive end who was also uh, dating um, a girl at UK, uh, you can stay, but you got to be back Monday night. And we said, okay, great. We're behind 16 to nothing at half. And Kentucky was horrible. Uh, so there was a lowly sophomore. I saw my weekend drifting away. And so I got up and gave one of the best speeches I think I ever gave. And we won 17 to 16. So. And you got to stay. And I got to stay. And I remember sitting on the sidewalk as the bus pulled away. And I was, uh, I was waving to him. That was the same uh, year, uh, my sophomore year that the Wichita State uh, airplane crashed and killed um, their football team. Uh, and then a, uh, uh, Marshall, uh, the Marshall uh, team as well. They, I think it was that same year when they were here. Uh, so we were playing at Ole Miss. We landed in Oxford 
um, the runways are too small for um, a DC-8 to land. So in two Martin 404s twin turboprop engines, this was the week after the Marshall crash, uh, I got on the wrong plane and <laughs> the left engine wouldn't start. And it finally started belched out smoke and fire. And I said, oh, God, I said, I'm going to be on the wrong airplane and this is the one that's going to go down. This is the one that's going to go down. And then my other uh, football story, we were flying into play Virginia. Uh, there was a hurricane off the uh, Atlantic coast, and we were in a jet, and we started to land. Uh, we were in a chartered jet and started to land, and all of a sudden, the pilot came on and says, we're aboard, we're aboard, and you could feel the power, and it went up. I remember Taylor Stokes was next to me with a cup of coffee, and as we started up, we hit an air pocket. The coffee was and it went down. The coffee was still up in the air. I remember <laughs> being up in the air, still shaped like a cup. And then, and Taylor's eyes got about that big round. Uh, I don't know what uh, happened to me, but anyway, we landed. Uh, we drove four and a half hours. So, anyway, so you, you are dating your the genie while you're in college. Just my life. No, just yeah, yes, I am. Yes, yes, yes. So you're right. Got married. We were married June 30th of 1973. We graduated uh, May 24th of 1973 and married June 30th of 1973. 50th anniversary here in Italy Italy with uh, four children and four soon to be five grandchildren. Uh, Well, let's go back to uh, how did you get to law school? My wife's dad was an orthopedic surgeon, Gil Bird, B-U-R-D, uh, who I loved. Um, he grew up uh, during the Depression. Uh, his dad was an engineer uh, in Binghamton, New York, uh, died when he was three years old. Uh, his uh, mother raised him. They lived with relatives most of the time. Um, he worked his way through. Niagara College, working construction. Uh, He had a scholarship uh, because he was a boxer and he also played in a jazz band. Um, He hurt his foot and he couldn't play football. So he went into the dean and says, you know, I've got to drop out of school. He says, well, why? And he says, well, I hurt my foot. I can't play football. I don't have a scholarship anymore. He says, well, we'll work something out. And so he got a job in the hospital and he admired this one orthopedic surgeon and says, I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon. So long story short, he went to George Washington um, uh, for medical school, uh, was um, at uh, Campbell Clinic in Memphis, uh, met uh, Molly Bird, Bird from Tupelo, Mississippi, um, on a blind date. Uh, he was dating another woman and his friend was dating Molly. And Molly and Joe struck it together. And, and hence Jeannie. And hence Jeannie and her four brothers and sisters. Uh, but uh, Dr. Bird was a field surgeon for World War II through North Africa right. and up through Italy. Um, he came back um, and asked Molly to marry him. Um, she didn't want to move to Binghamton, New York, or Washington, D.C. is where Joe wanted to go. Um, and to work at Walter Reed. And Joe didn't want to go to Tupelo, Mississippi, so they decided on Nashville, Tennessee. So, uh, and so, so, how did you get interested in law school? Um, I would bring Jean home 11, 11 30 at night, um, and I'd see her dad leaving to go out on rounds. And I went, geez, that's hard work. I don't want to be a doctor. I know I wanted to be something, a doctor, a lawyer. I sold insurance my last year of law school, was number one college salesperson or whatnot, and did that for about five or six months after school or after uh, Vanderbilt. I said, I just don't like this. Now you're married. And now we're married. And uh, Jeannie is a nurse. She is a public health nurse. She was a nurse right after she came back to Vanderbilt her junior and senior year, uh, graduated from Vanderbilt Nursing. Uh, was a psychiatric nurse for a while, then worked as a public health nurse here and then in law school as well. 
Um, and she loved it. And we got all kinds of vegetables from all her. Uh, oh, Beside that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. From all her. Uh, so you're, the so process of elimination is what I'm hearing. Yes, yeah. it was. It many, was. Uh, did you know I, many lawyers? I there? knew Dick Taylor. Uh, he and my dad were at Father Ryan High School together. Uh, and so I knew him. I uh, knew Tom Higgins uh, from Cathedral Church. His mom went Thomas to Mass Aquinas. every day. Thomas Aquinas Higgins. A federal uh, judge. My yeah. mother said he was lace curtain Irish. Oh, really? See, my grandmother was always shanty Irish. That was my father. <laughs> oh, my, uh, my uncle, Joe Carreri, um, always called her shanty Irish, and she always called him a dado. So anyway, that was, that was, that was the running... They were the best of friends. So she says, "No, I'm lace curtain." She says, "No, you're Shanny Hours." So um, anyway, so, so how did you pick a law school? Um, Vanderbilt was really expensive. I think it was like twenty two hundred dollars or something like that. Uh, UT was on the quarter system, and I think was three hundred dollars or wow. the, it was dirt cheap. Um, and I remember when we drove up to uh, UT. Uh, and the only UT I ever seen was playing football, and they were not nice to us. So, uh, but I said, "Yep, yeah, I'm going to go do this." So we drove up. I said, oh, "Man, the campus is absolutely wonderful. I just love this. Look at all these athletic things. The summer is going to be great." And she says, "What do you mean?" I says, "Well, the summer's when I'm out of school." She says, "No, no, no. I looked. You can go through the summers." And I said, "I've never been to summer school." She says, "No, we're going to go to summer school." So I started in uh, September of 1974 and finished in December of 1976. So, you know, straight through. And um, it sounds as though GE played a role in your. Oh, good gosh, yes. Life here. You know, there were guys in uh, law school who weren't married, and I don't know how they did it. I really do not. I'm, I'd, I'd be nowhere without GE, and I don't tell her that enough. And I think I'll call her as soon as this is over and, and tell her that. Um, but she would drop me off in the morning at uh, quarter seven. Uh, I'd do some work. I'd do my classes. Uh, I'd then go and um, uh, study, finish up whatever needed to be done, uh, play racquetball or squash. Uh, we had an IM football team and an IM basketball team. I'd do either that. And Jean would pick me up when she was off at five o'clock. And we'd come home to our $100 a month apartment at the golf range apartments in Knoxville. Uh, which are now our soccer field. Every place I've lived is now <laughs> it's now demolished. Um, my parents' home on Bellwood is still uh, is still, still standing. Well, it's still standing. Um, do you recall any of your favorite law school professors? Derwood Jones. Uh, he was our tax guy from Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, I'd never seen anybody as animated as he was. That's strange for tax law. Uh, oh, yeah, but the seersucker suit, the whole nine yards, he made it interesting. In fact, his exam was the next day after Katie, our first child, uh, was born. She was due on July 4th, 1976, and I was ready for her to be Betsy Ross Marchetti. For sure. She was three weeks late, so she became... Uh, 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 Catherine Miles Marchetti after mom's maiden name. She is now 46. What's a lawyer? Uh, is a lawyer, yes. Yeah. And, um, then have Lou. and then Lou is in private equity. He is 44. Intensive. He is the one about to have a little boy or a little girl. He won't tell us, and he says he doesn't know. And okay. But my great grandmother, uh, Anna Maria Corrieri, Said if it's carried down here, it's a boy. So Low, we it's think it's it. Low is going to be a boy. He's in Austin, Texas. He's in Austin, Texas. And then George is forty-one. George is forty-one. He is in Austin, Texas. Uh, he became a teacher, uh, teaching uh, in the Austin school system and the Deval uh, school system. Uh, he's a Spanish um, English teacher, so a lot of his kids are. Uh, okay. Immigrant children, and then Mary Margaret is 36. our baby, thirty-six. She is the one who has cystic fibrosis, and we took her to Yugoslavia in March of 1987 because the Blessed Mother was appearing in Medjugorje, and we wanted a blessing, or we wanted a cure, we wanted a healing to be healed, and we met the priest who 
was the mentor to the children who saw the Blessed Mother uh, one day walking back, and it was snowing, spitting snow, it was cold, uh, up in the mountains, Medjugorje, uh, about three hours from Dubrovnik. And uh, we saw Father Slavko, um, and Jeannie had Mary Margaret and said, uh, How old was she then? She was back four? Six months old. Six months old. Yeah. I didn't realize she'd gone that early. Oh, yeah. She was, about, well, uh, nine months old. She was born uh, June 6th of uh, uh, 2008 or 1986. Um, so this was March of 1987. And I'll never forget Father Slavko. Right. God's will is done, and that you can accept God's will. And to me, that meant a lot. Jean was angry. She, <laughs> she wanted, she wanted oh, I want a healing prayer. I want it fixed. But I thought back on that morning more than once on um, God's will, and Father Fleming's prayer was always uh, give me the grace to know God's will and the courage to do it. Um, and that was repeated with Father Zofko uh, that day. It was March 19th of St. Joseph's Feast Day uh, and blowing snow. Um, I had Mary Margaret under my coat. I remember that because uh, the place we stayed had a, what I thought was a clock radio. It was actually the heater. And they would turn the heat because you stayed with the people uh, living there. And these were poor country people. And um, it was so cold, she would sleep in her snowsuit on my chest, <laughs> about eight blankets on it. So, but I came back and people said, Have you had some work done? I said, What do you mean? I said, Your face, it just seemed relaxed. I said, There were no telephones, <laughs> there were no clients, no there was no anything. My wife and my baby. Yeah, that was it. So, so maybe you just need, and Demetri Kaladimos uh, went with us and did a, a documentary on it called A Matter of Faith. Uh, which we watched about a year ago, and it was so funny. So how is your daughter doing? Black care. She's doing well, doing well. Um, unfortunately, uh, about a month ago, she had a little pain, uh, went got checked, and uh, has breast cancer. So she had a uh, double mastectomy scheduled for this past Monday, but got COVID, so it got pushed off to March 27. But she is my hero. She absolutely is my hero. I don't know that you can say she overcame the cystic fibrosis. No, but um, one of those answers to prayer uh, is that God made some really smart doctors and pharmacy people, and they came up with a drug uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, which has been a miracle drug for about 95% of the CF patients. Um, and it's just worked wonders. Yeah, her lung functions have gone from mid 70s up to the high 80s, low That's 90s, wonderful. and gain weight because uh, CF interferes with uh, the water transfer in the cells, so they become real sticky and mucusy like. So it makes uh, your ducts for your pancreas, you have digestive issues, breathing issues in your lungs, et cetera. So she still does a couple hours of treatment, uh, plus has a five and a half year old uh, girl, Betty, after my mom, um, and Cole, her husband's mom, um, who passed away from cancer well, several you years ago. Four grandchildren. I don't want to ignore any of them either. No. Oh. Lorenza. Lorenza Lolo. And she is the daughter of Katie. Miriam. Miriam, it's aka eight. Mimi. She's eight, uh, Katie, and then Violet, six. Uh, who is six, and then Betty, who is five and a half. Um, somebody says, oh, Lorenzo, is that a uh, family name? She says, no, that's the Katie's dressmaker from Milan. <laughs> All three of the girls were born in um, uh, London. Uh, Katie's uh, contracts teacher at uh, uh, UT. Well, let's talk about no, Katie for a minute, because you mentioned her in... Uh, the comments that you gave me, and she ended up going to law school. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about Katie after she graduated from Notre Dame. Sure. Um, she worked for three years in Chicago uh, with an executive search firm. Um, and then her boyfriend from Notre Dame was um, 
pass with McKenzie to Dublin. And so Katie says, oh, gosh, well, I'll just follow him over there, which was wonderful. But while over in Dublin, she met another young man um, from Dublin. And so she <laughs> yeah, dropped the other boyfriend and took up with the new boyfriend, the Dublin guy, who mom did not appreciate at all. Um, long story short, uh, she was there briefly and then transferred back and said, Dad, I think I'd like to go to law school. Uh, I said, well, you know, uh, have at it. What do you think? I said, well, I think I'll go to uh, stay up here. Uh, so she did her first year at, uh, oh gosh, I'm not Chicago uh, School of Law. DePaul. Uh, DePaul, thank you. Um, and I said, Katie, this costs a lot of money. Why don't you go to UT? Oh, well, I don't know if I could get in. I said, well, just make your application. Long story short, she got in. Uh, and did very well um, and did a super job. And her contract teacher's father was with the World Bank. And since we had Italian citizenship, they said, Katie, you should get your master's. Uh, and so Katie went to London uh, and got, quote, in-state tuition at King's College and then worked for Herbert Smith for, I want to say, about two and a half, three years, uh, doing mergers and acquisitions literally all over the world. Tel Aviv, Paris, Milan, Singapore, I mean, Beijing. I remember you saying you were going to go visit her while she was in London. Oh, gosh, yeah. And that was so much fun. Um, just, uh, we go for two weeks and get a flat. Uh, well, first, we, before she was married, we were staying uh, with her, uh, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and then she met this young man from Dublin uh, and had an absolutely wonderful time visiting with him, visiting his family uh, in Portran, which is right outside of Dublin. In fact, I was speaking with someone from Ireland and I said, oh, my son-in-law's right outside of Dublin. And they said, oh yeah, I swear, it says Portran. She said, oh, the asylum. They had an asylum of 1,500 people, which is no longer in operation, but it was, and his grandfather uh, was a caretaker there. So anyway, um, they lived in London until three and a half years ago. They came back here. So all the girls were born in London, and we absolutely love visiting them. And well, it's good to have them back. Oh, gosh, it's wonderful to have them back. And I think so they like being before back. Before she returned, though, she had been in a private equity group? Yes, uh, GLG group. Um, they furnished the back office work for private equity. And that's what she's doing today. And that's what she's doing today. In fact, she just returned from a conference in Puerto Rico for five days. Uh, she landed and her husband, who's a, a chief marketing officer for NASDAQ, um, took off for San Francisco. <laughs> so anyway, it's uh, I, I don't know how they do it. I thought you my made, life was You busy. made a comment that she is now uh, working with a company that invests in only minority and women-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. Right. And how does she like that? She loves it. She loves it. She is an advocate from one end of the top of her head to the end of her toes. And um, if there's a cause, she's on it. Um, um, she's great. I just, yeah. Um, she's my hero. Uh, all my kids are my heroes. One's my conscience. Uh, we always <laughs> Everybody sure. should have a child. Like that. <laughs> so would you recommend law as a career to them, or did you? Um, I did not. Um, I loved it. Um, I wanted them to be whatever they wanted to be. Um, Katie, as I said, worked for three years after she got out of Notre Dame, and then she made the call. Um, she's the only one. That she's the only one that became a lawyer. Uh, Lou played football at uh, North Carolina, and he received an award for the highest academic average of any uh, ACC player his senior year. So he received a sixty thousand um, dollar scholarship, uh, which was good for I think four or five years. Um, he worked for a year uh, after he graduated with a degree in finance from um, uh, Flagler School in North Carolina and worked for a year, then went to work for Condoleezza Rice in D.C. 
Uh, and then called one day and says, Dad, I think I'd like to go to business school. I said, where? He said, well, Harvard, Stanford, and Warden. <laughs> I went Harvard, Stanford, or Warden. I said, well, you've got that 60000 We can help you with some of the rest and some student loans uh, later. So um, anyway, he, uh, he went to Warden, and uh, he was graduating uh, after two years. And we said, uh, he says, well, uh, my graduation's, you know, so-and-so. And I says, well, great. Well, I was on the board for uh, DRI at that time, um, serving as president of the IDC. And we had an all-expense week trip to Portugal for our board meeting. The audience, what is DRI? Oh, DRI is a Defense Research Institute, a group of 23,000 lawyers okay. uh, and from... Other? And the other one is the IDC International Association of Defense Council. We just celebrated our 100th anniversary in 2022. Um, and we currently have lawyers, members from 42 countries, I believe, in about 2,500. Uh, so you all went to Portugal. We, we were going to Portugal. And it happened to occur at the same time of Lou's graduation from Wharton. And I said, geez, Gene, we went to his kindergarten, his eighth grade, his high school, his UNC graduation. I said, you know, do we really need to go to business school? And she said, well, you're right, because we go to that. So Lou calls, and I'm going to tell him, Lou, we love you. We're so proud of you, but um, we're, <laughs> we're going to Portugal to stay in this 10-star uh, resort, et cetera. And so I Almost ready to tell him, man. I said, so graduation? He says, yeah. And I, I was going to call you. And I said, oh, about what? I said, about graduation. I said, well, what about it? He says, well, you know, the class elects someone to give the commencement address. And they elected me. Oh. I went, oh. So when are y'all coming? I said, oh, gosh, I guess the day before. <laughs> I hung up. Gene said, well, did you tell them we weren't coming? I said, it's a, been a slight change. And she said, what? And I told her, she went, oh, gosh. Well, we have to go. I, said, and I know we do. So so he and Dr. Eunice, who did the micro lending in India to help women get out from under the uh, yoke of these uh, robber um, lenders. Um, the small he, loans. Yeah, right, he was the other speaker. <laughs> so who... I learned about seven new countries because whenever someone graduated, they put their name up in their country, and there were six countries I'd never heard of um, wow. graduating that day. So but we were talking about your children and not um, necessarily encouraging them to go to school, and you said that you were a little bit ambivalent about encouraging them, and mm -hmm. why was that? Um, I wanted them to find their own way. Um, I'd seen some lawyer folks um, that I was associated with who went in because dad, grandpa, well, it whatever. It was just, yeah, you got to go do it. And they just weren't that happy. They were good at it. Um, and in fact, Katie called uh, after working with Herbert Smith for about three and a half, four years one day. I just, you know, Kate, how's everything going before she was married? And she says, Oh, it's okay. Well, how's work? Oh, it's okay. I said, what's wrong? She said, I'm just not liking it. I said, get out. She said, what? I said, get out. I said, get out. But they're paying me a ton of money. <laughs> I said, I don't care, Katie. Get out. I said, well, why, Dad? I said, Lewis was walk on it in North Carolina, and he was about to. Uh, he called one day, and it's the same discussion. Well, I thought I'd get a scholarship, but I hadn't got one. And I said, well, if you're not 100%, Lou, you're going to get hurt. So just quit. Stop. But you don't want me to quit. I said, I don't want you getting hurt. And if you're not 100%, it's not going to work. And um, literally that next day, coach called him in. He was going in to talk to the coach, Sam. I'm not going to be there. It's Mac Brown. Um, I'm not going to be uh, there uh, anymore. And he said, I've been looking all over you, Lou, because two of his buddies had gotten scholarships as walk-ons. And um, he, Mac said, you know, we want to give you a scholarship. So for his last three years, he had a scholarship, but told Katie the same thing uh, with this. So that's when she got into the private equity and 
more public relations uh, interaction with, uh, so with people in the law. One of your observations about the law is over the 45 years, how it's changed. And I think you said a lot of those changes also impacted whether you would mm -hmm. advise a yeah. young person to go into it. Yeah. What kind of changes did you see? It got less personal. Um, which is, I mean, Satsuma restaurant. You go sit around the table at Satsuma. With a bunch of lawyers. Hey, with a bunch of lawyers and, you know, and just talking or you'd be at the Gerst house when motions were at one o'clock on Friday afternoon. So uh, get your pig knuckle or your oyster roll and uh, that gigantic thing of Sipacol um, uh, as you checked out. Um, I remember Mac Glasgow and gosh, uh, he was um, God, Jack Madden got into it one afternoon for a one o'clock motion. I was, oh my gosh, yes. you learn a lot. Oh, yeah, you really did. You know, of course, Mac was my senior partner. I was let's, let's go to that. Anyway. Tell me about uh, when you took the bar exam and what did you do after that? Yeah, um. Bar exam was February of 1977. Uh, we had a six-month-old daughter, uh, Katie. Uh, she and Jeannie came back to Nashville to stay with her mom and dad. Uh, Father Anderson, uh, who was the chaplain for St. Mary's Hospital, um, said he could I could stay in the rectory with him, just a little too better while getting ready for the bar. And the only requirement is that I had to serve mass at 5:30 a couple of days, <laughs> a couple of days a week. But afterwards, the nuns would prepare a dinner, or, you know, a table this big or a breakfast uh, for you. Uh, so it was good. So did my six weeks bar review, took our uh, bar course, and we were in the Court Square building. The, yeah, who was we? Where did you go to work? Oh, uh, Glasgow Adams and Taylor. And uh, who were they? It was Mac Glasgow, S. McFeeters Glasgow, uh, Alf Adams Jr., whose dad was the chancellor here for many, many, many years, uh, Richard Taylor, and then Mike Philbin, um, all of whom are now deceased. So that makes me old. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I didn't realize that Mike Philbin. Yeah. I did. About I did know that. four years, about four years ago. All members uh, of the National Bar. All members of the National Bar. And of course, Chancellor Adams, Judge Adams, uh, he was Atticus Finch personified in my mind. Um, and he would go to the arcade, to the peanut shop, get a little 25 cent bag of peanuts, stick them in his pocket. And he'd come in and my office is about, you know, six feet by eight feet. And he'd come in and flip a peanut to you. And one day he flipped a peanut. I grabbed it. I said, this is just like feeding the monkeys in the zoo, isn't it, Judge? He said, what do you mean, just like? And, just, <laughs> and, and kept walking. We would have birthday parties for uh, whoever that month uh, had a birthday. Uh, and I was in there one day, coat and tie, without my coat. And Chancellor Adams says, young man, you're not properly dressed. I said, I'm sorry, what? He says, there will be ladies presents. Go we'll get your coat. So I went and got my coat. And that's, the way you practice <laughs> and that's the way you practice law. Well, I think you also said that when you began, uh, it was different because you would use cassette tapes. Oh, yeah. People may not even know what a cassette tape is. Yeah. What did you do? Uh, you would dictate into a machine a microphone on a cassette tape, and then that cassette tape uh, would go into a playback a tape recorder with the headphones and she would listen to uh, what was being done on her IBM Selectrics. Um, I think we we're just starting to get computers, a Xerox computer, I think it was, and it was about that big and it was kind of like Nintendo or whatever, the Pong, you know, the old uh, machines is what it reminded me of. Uh, I had a client who said, if I didn't get a fax machine, we were not going to be able to represent them anymore. So I remember getting a fax machine. It was probably 19, gosh, 87, 88, yep. somewhere thereabouts. Right and the paper would come out and it would curl up. And if you didn't make a copy of the paper within a day or two, the ink would disappear. So 
you, but we and you tear it off, you know, like a teletype uh, type machine. But you meet with people, you talk with people, uh, like Judge Higgins said, you know, have y'all talked about this case in his he do his own case management conferences. And um, I remember one day I was uh, um, defending um, uh, uh, an EEOC case, and uh, Judge uh, Higgins asked uh, the opponent, says, uh, uh, have y'all talked about settling this? And I said, well, Your Honor, he hadn't made a demand. Mr. Smith, how do you expect Mr. Marchetti to buy that horse if you don't put a price on it? So, <laughs> anyway. Which is true. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. He says, I want you to, uh, y'all to meet. I don't care if you have to meet naked at Church Street at midnight on Saturday. I want y'all to sit down and talk about this. And I remember him trying cases against him. I had three different ones. We'd go sit in his office, had these big wingback chairs. He'd have a cigar and he'd talk about it. Uh, the, the case. case, yeah. So just sit and talk, and that's the hardest thing nowadays to, with young lawyers to. Uh, yeah, I had one the other day that calls a new lawsuit, and uh, I called him up. I said, "So we're defending." I said, "So what do you want? What do you need?" I said, "Tell me what you need. What do you need? What documents? Whatever. Who do you need to talk with? I well, no I'll, I'll get discovery out to you." I said, no, no. no. <laughs> I want to try to figure it out. I said, "I've been too many times where we spend a." year and a half, we've each spent $100,000, and then we say, oh, well, let's talk about settling this case. And then he said, not only have I got $100,000 in legal fees, but I'm angry yeah. <laughs> because of all this back and forth. So not me, the client. I said, just, oh, I said, so, so, well, I said, just send me a list of what you need, as long as it's not privileged or whatever. I said, oh, okay. And he did, and we got it settled, you know, in a couple of months uh, right. for a reasonable now, I don't so, want to shortchange no, no. you because one of the things that I neglected to ask you is where you clerked while you were in law school. No. Because that was an invaluable. Butler, Vines, Babb, and Threadgill in Knoxville, Tennessee, for the princely sum of $3.50 an hour. In what year? Uh, 1976. Six. Okay. Uh, 75, 76. Yeah. I, okay. My first semester was the fall of 74. Yeah, I went to January of 1975. And we did a lot of asbestos plaintiff's work uh, back then. And I remember Judge Taylor, we had the J.C. Penney case that eventually went to uh, um, the Sixth Circuit. Um, for uh, outrageous conduct. And we were arguing a summary judgment motion. And I remember Judge Taylor, he was about five, six. He was about 107 years old. And we were going back and forth <laughs> with the summary judgment. And he put his hands over and says, Big one, I don't want to hear any more about this case. No more, no more. I went, whoa. It's, yeah, is yes, this what the law is? So anyway, um, but it was it was good. It was good. Um, we worked late one uh, one Friday, and um, Bill Vines came in. and says, "Call your wives." Uh, I had another uh, John Gwynn, uh, who also uh, became a judge, and said, uh, "You call your wives, and I'll come down." And you're going to Regus's restaurant for uh, dinner. Because <laughs> we'd been buying 10 cent hot dogs at 7 Eleven up the street. So, uh, or tuna casserole. Of course you yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, anyway, so we had a big time. Katie came down. I remember her carrying her note with her basket and set her next to the table. So, but it was fun. It was good. Good people. Good people. So, once you started practicing, um... In Nashville, after you passed the bar, what type of uh, litigation experience or what did you do? We were defense counsel in Nashville for Travelers Insurance. They were probably 60% of our work, I suspect. And so back then, a big case was maybe $40,000, $50,000. I mean, that was big money. Um, we also had the... Um, Case Arnold Engineering Center uh, explosion, um, we 
which had 15 or 16 different parties uh, in that. Uh, that was pretty exciting. Um, but we would try a case, jury case, once a week, I guess. You know, were, yeah, a new, yeah, a new lawyer. In fact, <laughs> my first jury trial, uh, I was uh, second chair to Dick Taylor. Um, Dick says, well, we're fourth on the docket. Just, you know, go there. It's Joe Loser's court. And um, so I said, well, I'll wander on up, took the client up, and we were sitting there. You know, Smith versus Jones. Uh, we've settled, Your Honor. Uh, Dick Taylor was not there. Um, Johnson versus all uh, three McPhee. Settled out. All three settled out. Uh, you know, uh, Johnson versus Williams. Uh, plaintiff ready, Your Honor. Um, uh, counsel for defense. Uh, we're ready, Your Honor, except Mr. Taylor uh, will be here directly. Um, do you have a law degree, Mr. Marquette? I said, yes, Your Honor. You admitted to practice in state Tennessee? I said, yes, Your Honor. Then yes. we're ready to go. <laughs> so um, I was halfway through board hour when uh, Dick Taylor came walking in and he started to, excuse me, I apologize for being late. I said, so, Mr. Marquette's doing just fine. So, <laughs> so you can have a seat, Mr. Taylor. So, so anyway, and we got a directed verdict. So, uh, anyway. Must have been doing really Oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Before we really get into yeah. a lot of uh, litigation experience, I want to ask you about some of the basics that you learned in general sessions. Oh, gosh. And also with a John Cobb. Oh, gosh. Um, we had um, a real estate practice then, um, a lot of closings, and we searched titles. Uh, and you didn't search titles for real estate on a computer. You actually went to the courthouse and you'd pull out the book that had A B. They were huge. They were massive. I mean, you know, Eight. two and a half feet by one and a half and about four inches thick. And you would search. go down names. The of yeah. And it was handwritten. It, well, I think they finally ended up typing the pages. Um, uh, but it, I yeah, know. I think it was all handwritten. Um, and then to really make sure you knew what you were doing, you go over to the Stallman building, uh, lawyer's title, uh, and there was John Cobb, um, who was just a delightful, delightful, delightful man. I mean, he's like your grandfather, and he was so patient. And well, have you checked this? And it was index cards similar to. A library where you'd be looking for a book, and I'd say, well, "Mr. Cobb, I've got some some. Uh, what was that? John? Mm, is that that property on Twelfth Avenue?" I said, yeah, you know. Hold on just a second. He'd go back and he'd bring out some plat, and he says, "Now be careful. You've got this easement right here." <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Uh, it's John Rochford's uh, father-in-law, uh, too, by the way, who's a big developer now. So I'm sure that's where he got his uh, thing. But he was so, so, so nice, John Cobb, and that, and of course, General Sessions Court. And I think when I started practicing, the jurisdictional limit may have been $1,500. Right. And then it went to $3,000, $5,000, mm -hmm. and on up. And one of my first cases was with Bart Durham. And he had an accident victim. Uh, I had the driver of the other vehicle. Uh, who had had too much to drink. Uh, but I told my client, don't volunteer, don't volunteer, don't volunteer. Yes, no, those are good questions. Tell the truth, number one, but don't guess, don't volunteer. Bart asked him, do you remember how much you had to drink that night? No, I, I don't. Uh, well, surely you had to remember how much. No, 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 I don't. Uh, well, are you telling me that you can't remember how many drinks you had? No, sir. Uh, you know, you know you're under oath. I know I'm under oath, but I don't remember how much I had to drink. Literally, and, and I said, Judge, he's asking and answer this three times. I I think we're done. And uh, I think it was senior Gail Williams and says, Yeah, Mr. Uh, uh, Durham, I I think we're done with that. And so he started to sit down, and my witness says, But it was the NCAA playoffs. And they ran out of those little glasses, so they were serving them in big glasses, those big tumblers. 
Oh, I was thankful that the jurisdictional limit was three thousand dollars. So, and I remember Gail Robinson looking at me over his glasses like that and saying, "Mr. Marchetti, thank you, Honor. Y'all want to go out and talk about this one, so anyway." And you did. And we did. Well, how did how did you take to uh, representing people in car wrecks? I really didn't care who ran the red light, uh, to be perfectly honest. And one, I think I'd been practicing about a year and a half, two years. Uh, Dick Taylor said, uh, a buddy of mine has a farm up in um, Christian County, Kentucky, uh, and they've got some bankruptcy hearing over here for Frosty Morn uh, Packers. And would uh, you need to go over there with them. And so we did. We went into the bankruptcy referees uh, room then, which was probably about the size of this conference room. And there were so many people there in overalls and very concerned cattle salesmen uh, that we adjourned to Judge Morton's courtroom. Uh, there were like 160 farmers uh, who had been taken advantage of by Frosty Morn. Frosty Morn had a plant in Kentucky, Clarksville, and they had one in North Carolina. They would pay the farmers in Kentucky with checks drawn on North Carolina Bank, and they would pay the farmers in North Carolina with checks drawn on the Clarksville Bank. So in the four or five day float they got, that's how they were uh, Balance, I mean, staying they, ahead. Staying ahead, correct. I wouldn't call it cutting checks. No, 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 no. But. So we ended up, uh, so I ended up representing 20 or 30 farmers um in a three-week trial in bankruptcy court when i'd been practicing about a year and a half for two years and uh, uh bill farmer was the assistant u.s attorney and we learned all about the packers and livestock act of 1976 which created a trust fund uh, that those funds were in trust for those farmers who weren't paid we came ahead of secured creditors Banks, everybody. So uh, anyway, so that was fun. Judge Clive Bear came down from Knoxville uh, to try that case. And he looked like the winter warlock from uh, uh, Santa Claus coming to town. That's every time I saw him, I remember. So is that how you got involved in commercial? In commercial work. And I said, this I enjoy. And then into construction work uh, as well. And um, I enjoyed the business part. Um, uh, it was. I, I enjoyed the general counsel part and trying to keep people out of the courthouse, uh, which seemed to be a much happier group of people than <laughs> those who I was asking to spend a week uh, in a conference room with depositions. Well, I wanna I wanna ask you about your involvement with the bar association, their annual meeting, and oh. the skits that you. <laughs> Daryl Thompson, who was a fraternity brother of mine at um, Vanderbilt. Uh, and John McLemore and I uh, were somehow tabbed uh, to do skits for the uh, uh, bar auxiliary uh, functions. And we had so much fun doing it. I think we did it four or five or six years. Um, and one year we uh, did a spoof of the judges. And um, I think we pushed the envelope. <laughs> Just just a bit, but it was delightful. And all the wives would know each other and see each other. And it was it was just a closer knit. Personal relationship. Oh, it absolutely was. And the spring picnics and uh, whatnot. And then the, this was the winter um, um, celebration banquet. Um, and they were just so much fun, so much fun. And so. did you have any Positions that you held with the bar? I was secretary treasurer uh, one year. Uh, and then I got more involved with the uh, International Association of Defense Council. And um, that started taking up a lot, a lot, a lot of time. And the National Dawson Attorneys Association, uh, since we represent the uh, Catholic Church in Tennessee, uh, Middle Tennessee now. Uh, Tennessee was one diocese until 1970 when Memphis Diocese was created. And then 1988, I remember being sent by Bishop Nudius uh, this gigantic document on parchment uh, in Latin from the Vatican, creating the Diocese of Knoxville in 1988. So that left 
the Diocese of Nashville, the 38 counties. So uh, we started representing the, Dick Taylor had been representing the Diocese. Yeah, I was going to ask you how you got involved in representing the Catholic Diocese. Yeah, it was uh, Dick Taylor uh, took over for, gosh, I forget the uh, lawyer, but Dick had been doing it since That's called the mid 60s. Uh, no, we're just called the Dawson Attorney. The Episcopal Diocese uh, does call them with David Herbert. And David and I did several um, courses on church law and First Amendment uh, and the like. Um, and representing the diocese, it's interesting because you're in two different worlds. You're in civil law, Tennessee, and the federal statutes and common law. But you also have this thing called canon law, um, one end which is church law, uh, which was codified in 1917 and then updated in 1983 with miscellaneous changes uh, throughout, uh, particularly given the abuse issues and the uh, well, I was going to ask plenary. you to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. when you first started representing, you talked about what was the nature of the work back then? A lot of real estate at the very beginning um, and some contracts. Um, and construction. and construction type of work. Um, Father Ryan sold their property in 1987 on Elston and moved out to Oak Hill. Um, Catholic Charities of Tennessee was incorporated in 1914. Uh, St. Mary's Orphanage uh, was about the same time. Uh, but then we started to create other entities because people understood corporations as opposed to what's this amorphous thing called a parish or a diocese or whatnot. Um, so we had, now we have, I think, 20 different corporations um, under the umbrella of the bishop. Um, so the bishop, once every five to seven years, uh, makes what's called an ad limina visit to Rome. And he and the other bishops from Region 5, which is Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, um, all those bishops will sit in a room, probably nicer than this, <laughs> some gold and big chairs, uh, with the Pope. And the Pope doesn't care about corporations, etc. He wants to know how's everything in your diocese, uh, bishops falling. And so though he doesn't control everything, he does have oversight for all the entities within his thing, which includes abuse issues and uh, the welfare of various and sundry people under his guidance. I think you said that uh, while you were active in some of the bar, local bar activities, you really became very interested in this International Association of Defense Council and the Association of Defense and Trial Attorneys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And actually took on a kind of a leading role. How did that Expand. Um, 2000 or 1989 uh, was when I went to my first meeting for the IEDC uh, in Maui, Hawaii, uh, as a guest of Mike Philbin. Um, and then I went to a second meeting as a guest, and then he said, You can't come as a guest anymore. <laughs> you need to join, and you're invited. You have to be over 40 years old, and you have to be. And I made the cut. Uh, uh, Mike managed to find one other person to uh, speak on my behalf and uh, uh, enjoyed it. It was wonderful. Um, what were some of the things that you did do? Uh, they had a wonderful meeting in London in 1992. And so we took the entire family uh, to London. And uh, we got to see Parliament uh, in session. Uh, we went down to the old Bailey, um, and Katie told a story when she was at uh, King's College. They went to the Bailey, uh, and someone was being arraigned, and that individual, um, uh, the judge, told him, well, you're entitled to representation, uh, and I says, I choose him, and this was a lawyer with his was hair wing, but it was gray and tattered. And she says, no, 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 that's the Queen's counselor. You can't choose him. He's the prosecutor. Says, well, who do I choose from? 
He says from them, and it's a bunch of young, fresh face, you know, white hair, he says they're not pretty guilty. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, uh, one thing that uh, Bailey had was uh, uh, they wore the robes in addition to the white hair, and they have a little pocket in the back of their cape. And that little pocket was for their remuneration as counsel to be given to them. And regardless of whether it was one pound or a hundred pounds, they would still represent their client zealously. So that's why they they never saw what they were paid, but they would represent their, their client as zealously as possible. So, uh, but we got to go to the Bailey, the ends of courts uh, that time, and really see how it began. Uh, one of my heroes is uh, patron saint of uh, lawyers, Thomas Moore, um, and got to see his cell um, in the Tower of London. Uh, and the story that uh, his wife came to him, asked him to, you know, please go along with Henry VIII and uh, ratify his declaration that um, this would be his legal wife and the divorce would be fine. And he says, uh, and then you'll have all the emoluments and your chancellor, your main chancellor, et cetera. And he said to his wife, Margaret, um, you know, Margaret, uh, you consider me a reasonably intelligent man. Yes, of course. And understand facts of a particular case yes yes this well what would it benefit me to enjoy a few more years on this earth and sacrifice my uh, moral and afterlife uh, welfare for these few years and i said oh that makes sense so he is uh, he's been my hero and not anywhere close to a thomas more but uh uh, he, he truly was a man. Uh, he truly was a man, a man for all seasons. So, so when you joined in 1990, what uh, what involvement did you have after that? Business litigation. They had several committees. Uh, business litigation uh, was one of the uh, large ones, uh, and then the crown jewel of the IEDC is a trial academy. Uh, and I was on two faculties at the trial academy. Uh, it was held at the University of uh, Colorado, which is an absolutely gorgeous campus, uh, and then at Stanford. Uh, so I was able to be on uh, two different um, um, faculties, faculties uh, for uh, the IEDC. Um, and you have five or six young lawyers, five or six years, and you take them all the way through from uh, trial prep, opening argument to closing argument, and you're each assigned a particular room, um, and I have never worked as hard <laughs> in my life as I did uh, during those uh, those sessions. Um, and you moved up. I became a chair of a couple of different committees, uh, um, and I it says it's international. So where were these meetings? Oh yeah, uh, interesting. Uh, Nineteen ninety eight. 99, the then president, we were down in Boca Raton, Florida at the Breakers. And he came up and says, we've had this London meeting, but we need to be more international if we're going to be international. Uh, and we had wars, we had one from Italy. We had five or six in London, three or four from Australia, uh, one from France, I believe. Says, but we really need to be international. And I says, okay, so what do you want us to do? He says, I want you, uh, the reinsurance committee chair and the litigation committee chair and you chair in business litigation, we're going to have a meeting in Lake Como. And this was in February of 99. And I says, when? He says, in April of 99. I said, so in two months, we're going to put this together. So we did. And I did a presentation in Lake Como on the uh, directors and officers uh, liability in Nashville, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, so I felt so great. I went home to my wife. I said, Jean, guess what? So I said, we got all expense paid to Lake Como in the uh, Villa Bellagio, uh, Villa San uh, Bellioni in uh, Bellagio. She says, oh, when is that? I told her, she said, oh, guess what? This is Margaret's graduating from eighth grade that year, or that morning. I said, I know. And then the flight's out at 2.30 that afternoon. <laughs> Well, the mothers and the daughters were going to Florida. I went, oh, okay. George, who's graduating, Father Ryan, came in and says, what are y'all talking about? I, says, I told him what it was. She says, so you're going to Italy? I says, yeah. He says, 
by yourself? And I said, yeah, I got to get back, work, whatever. You know. So a couple, three days later, I came back. I says, George, you're right. He says, by what? He says, Italy, going all the way over there. I think I'll stay, you know, seven days or eight days. Said, what? By yourself? I said, if you can find a flight for less than $500, you can come with me. And darn it, south, uh, not southwest, northwest had just started a flight on Tuesdays and Thursdays through Detroit to Malpensa, Milan's airport, and um, Georgia, and he planned the entire thing. So we were in Lake Como for three days, and we landed. I ordered an Opal Cadet. Oh, Mr. Marchese, I'm so sorry we do not have your car. I'm like, oh. You know, in my car, what am I supposed to Oh, no, no, not to worry, not to worry. Here we have others. Uh, Alfa Romeo, you like? <laughs> <laughs> so George and I had eight days in Tuscany um, in Alfa Romeo, San Gimignano, uh, Bologna. Uh, it was it was wonderful. So that was that was, that was the start. That was the start of my international and that put us up. And then uh, uh, a president later on, the first woman president of um, the IDC, Joan Eric from Indianapolis, uh, asked my wife and I to be the convention chairs in 2003. And we had really tough duty. We had the Greenbrier and we had uh, the Orchid uh, in Maui. And uh, so we were her convention chairs and she had contracted colon cancer and um, died before the July meeting, which was gonna be in Hawaii, uh, but we had a beautiful mass for her uh, at an outdoor church in Hawaii. And I remember the crucifix uh, of Jesus was in a, a sarong and he looked like a Samoan uh, dancer. I mean, it was, it, it was, it was, different. Uh, it was different. It was, it was very different. So, and then I was put on the board and then after four years on the board, uh, we had a meeting in Rome uh, in 2006, and um, Jeannie's sister had contracted breast cancer about five years before. It gone into remission, and but it popped back up that May and June. And Jean says, "Well, I can't go. I'm going to stay here." And Molly says, "No, you are going. Gino is going to be president, and I'm going to see white smoke <laughs> when he's elected." Um, <laughs> Gene says, okay, so I went uh, with the four children and um, stayed uh, in Rome, and it was just magical. And I was elected by president-elect, and then you move up to president the, uh, uh, the next year. And then um, while president started uh, diversity and inclusion uh, committee, uh, just to beginning with more winning to get them in since we had Joan Eric as our model, uh, just a life on a hell of a lawyer too. Um, but I wanted to be something more than pale, male, and stale. Uh, and Jean was a great impetus for that, as was Katie. Um, so I had a lot of help um, on that. And, and uh, what? Did you learn about other legal systems or lawyers in other countries? The most stunning was how much participation lawyers in America have versus lawyers in other countries. Uh, what do you mean? For example, uh, in Italy, uh, you submit your question <laughs> to the judge and he'll decide whether or not <laughs> it's a suitable question or would add to uh, his decision-making ability. Uh, in Germany, uh, the trial judge, uh, judges, uh, one would be, for example, if it's a construction case, one would be a representative of the construction company, not a lawyer. Uh, one would be from the employer standpoint, and then you'd have the judge in the middle. And again, you'd submit your questions so whether or not <laughs> it was necessary. Um, but we absolutely, absolutely uh, were fascinated by everyone and every system of justice and how cumbersome 
the rest of their systems are. It was just, <laughs> just amazing. I said, you know, how do you ever get anything done? Uh, uh, one quick example, uh, an Italian company had a furnace explosion in Harriman, Tennessee. There's these huge tile manufacturers there because of the type of clay. Um, and their entire management team is Italian. Uh, and I'm saying, so how long has this plant been here? Hey, two years. And I says, two years? How long did it take to build? A year and a half, two years. I says, so is that what usually happens? No, no, no. In Italy, 10 year minimum, 10 year minimum to open. <laughs> too many rules, too many rules. So, anyway, and we have rules here, but uh, nothing like. So, whenever I hear talking about deregulation and whatnot, I said, oh my gosh. So, anyway, I said to sign a lease in London, I mean, you 15 people needed to stamp something. It was anyway. So, I like it. It may not be the best, but it's the best. Yes. Ours, yes. So how did you have the Toronto Falls Justice Standard O'Connor? Oh, gosh. Um, the IEDC uh, has lawyers from every state and uh, several countries. Um, we have a foundation, uh, and we're always looking for projects. Um, one of those projects uh, was something called Our Courts. Uh, which Sandra Day O'Connor began to try to teach young people about our judiciary system. And in that process of teaching young people uh, and their parents about our court system, she began to see that not only children, where civics is only required, I think, in three states, um, but their parents had no idea about our not only judicial system, our whole manner of government, she was asked uh, ask her group about, you know, what the uh, three branches of government and, you know, a reasonably intelligent person said, well, uh, Democrat, Republican, and Independent. <laughs> just, no, 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 no. So that and uh, the independence of the judiciary. Um, so this was when I was president. And I said, well, why don't we make that? our goal for the foundation, because we've got lawyers in every state, and um, we asked her, what can we do to help you? She says, if we had a director in every state, that would be wonderful. So she came to our meeting at the uh, ends at Spanish Bay, and uh, she spoke, of course, uh, and we had breakfast with her, and I says, I think I've got 50 people, one person for every state to be your directors. You're kidding. We got them. And they, so now the directors of our ICIDICS now, not just our course, but ICIDICS, uh, we have a director in every um, state. Uh, but to listen to her tell her story, graduating number two from Stanford. <coughs> I think it's late 50. I couldn't get a job. Yeah. Redquist was number one. Um, she was offered a part-time job as a secretary in San Francisco, number two from Stanford. Um, and then a friend of hers, I think in the DA's office or the public defender's office says, we can't pay you, <laughs> but there's a desk. So-and-so just went off. So if you want to do it, do it. And uh, she told the story of uh, uh, they live uh, out in the country on a farm. So she went to school in town uh, and they were so conservative, her family, that Eleanor Roosevelt came to visit their school one day, and she said, if my dad had known that I was <laughs> shaking hands with Eleanor Roosevelt, he probably would have disowned me, but, uh, <laughs> but she was just, just wonderful, just a wonderful, wonderful person, and the Civics program is still going strong. It's interactive with children, uh, games, Nintendo-type stuff to uh, uh, learn about our um, court system, and I said, uh, or a civic system or a system of government, and I said, oh gosh, it's kind of like, I remember, you know, uh, I'm just a bill, uh, the cartoons on television, but much, much, much more sophisticated. Um, I think I shortchanged you a little bit when you first started. I was going to ask you, do you remember what you started earning when you 
$650 a month. I absolutely remember that. Of course, it also costs 50 cents to ride the bus. So anyway. It's a little less expensive, but $600 right. still was not. Expensive. Not not a lot. Not a lot. And Plus a bonus of any work that you brought in, you got 50% of the fee. And so I was commissioner of the parochial league basketball and football. Uh, and one of the head referees who got other referees was Bill Smith, who was the collection manager at U.S. Community Credit Union, which I had gone to with my dad as a federal employee. Um, and so I asked him one day, I says, Bill, who does your stuff? And I forgot who, who it was, uh, but I said, would you mind giving us a shot? And he said, sure. So started doing his stuff. And then he told me uh, another credit union and another credit union, another credit union. So that's how you build the credit. And that's how it started out. And so that money coming in a collection, and now we've got uh, five uh, people, and that's all they do is uh, collections uh, for various and sundry folks. And Somebody. and some of our really good clients have come from <laughs> people who for circumstances beyond their control, got behind, and we treated them with respect, and we understand what's going on. Now, that's not to say all of them <laughs> were wonderful, wonderful people, um, but, and we were usually the only lawyer they ever talked to, and so when they had their car accident or their <laughs> needed a house bought or whatever it was, and they call us up and say, can you represent us? So, um, anyway. Well, I one of the things that you mentioned early on was your daughter becoming a lawyer. And that is something that I think you said uh, has been maybe beneficial for you. And how is that? She brought me, I saw myself in her a lot of times. And the <laughs> Uh, banging of heads sometimes and the stubborn and uh, yep, yep, yep. And I said, well, there's a better way to do this, I think. And maybe if I listen more and talk less, uh, that would be help for me. And she's just got such a great heart. Uh, and she sees things in a different way than I did. Um, that said, maybe there's another way to do this, Dad. And she's smart as a dickens. So um, that was, she came with good bona fides. So, yeah. and I, I appreciate her very, 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 very much. Well, I think what I thought was very telling is that you were talking about your children and your wife doing a very good job of more or less reforming you so that. Uh, in a way, they were teaching you to listen more compassionately and with curiosity. Yep, 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 yep. And I've used that with a lot of people. Um, we've got uh, George, uh, our third child, is gay. Uh, and the Catholic Church has not treated them with the dignity that anyone would be involved with uh, or is entitled to and deserves. Um, and we've got a group called Always God's Children, which is parents and grandparents and brothers and sisters and some uh, individuals who themselves um, um, are part of the LGBTQ uh, community. Uh, and we meet at Christ the King. And our second meeting, uh, we were coming in to meet, and there's five, four people out front with cardboard signs saying you're an abomination, you're going to hell, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and some of the other people who started to get angry and says, well, let's talk to them. I'm not talking. Went out to talk to anybody. So went out and talked to them and, you know, I'm, I'm, they've got me, I've done these courses called uh, nonviolent communication. And part of it is these other individuals have a need. <laughs> And what is their need that they're trying to satisfy? And if you can understand their need and where they are, that might help you reach a common ground. 
And these individuals need, they're all my age or older, had been brought up, and this is the a law. Very narrow yeah. And this is it. And us saying, hey, it's okay to be gay is interfering with their need to stay this course. And we're pushing them, we're disrupting their flow. So that's why they are, are reacting the way they are. And one of the other people is, You've been listening to Warren Safer. You've read uh, Say What You Mean. I said, yes, because my children are getting me to do it. And my wife. And, uh, oh. So anyway, and it's really been beneficial, even in negotiations and discussions. It's very and, important. Oh, gosh. And, you know, but as before, no. No, but I'm right. My client's right. Well, maybe, let's see. Maybe he's not it's exactly really, right. um, about your involvement with Lawyers for Civil Justice and the federal rules. Right. Uh, about 30 years ago, I guess now, um, we've got basically four defense organizations, uh, Defense Research Institute, um, uh, the FTCC Federation of Defense and Corporate Council, um, the ADTA Association of Defense and Trial Attorneys, and the IADC. Um, we travel together. We go to different meetings for each other. Uh, and the groups from the court sister organizations came to our meeting just recently in Austin. Part of what we saw in which the plaintiff's bar did a lot better than the defense bar was impacting legislation uh, and our federal rules. Uh, and so we began the LCJ. I didn't, others did um, 30, 35 uh, years ago. Uh, and our primary goal was um, our federal rules. And so with that, uh, one of the things we very much worked on um, was um, e-discovery and allocating, we think more justly, uh, the burden of discovery particularly for a company such as a Microsoft or Apple or whatever, you can spend millions and millions of dollars on <laughs> discovery. Um, and one example on the Microsoft Lawyers Day, he says, uh, I think we went through something like 680,000 pages of documents and 13 of them were used at trial. <laughs> and so why should we? And so that burden shifting uh, was one of the uh, big things uh, that we were uh, able to accomplish. And I haven't been that active in recent years, so, uh, but I know they're going uh, far, far away. In fact, I remember one meeting uh, we had in DC uh, and it was at the hotel where Tesla was being introduced. <laughs> the Tesla vehicle outside. Oh, it's oh, electric. Oh, what's it? A big golf cart? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Oh, who want to invest in that? Anyway. Well, I think you also uh, conducted seminars for appellate judges. Yes, that's our uh, National Foundation for Judicial Excellence. Um, we, uh, the Plains Bar, uh, has something called the Roscoe Pound uh, Lectures. Um, so again, about 20 years ago, this same group of defense organizations. So why don't we do something like that? And so for two days, uh, Friday afternoon and all day Saturday uh, in Chicago in July, uh, we have a seminar uh, where we um, teach uh, appellate judges from across the country um, about what we feel are important aspects uh, from the corporate side or the insurance defense side um, relative to the appeals process. And we have anywhere from 140, uh, 160, I think the last one I attended was a couple of years ago, um, appellate judges and a remarkable number of women, I think 40% of the uh, judges attend. Um, Jeff Bivens, um, uh, I think it ends on a regular basis. So, um, and we usually have 
15 to 25 uh, members of the Supreme Courts of the various entities and learned that Texas has two Supreme Courts, one for, one for criminal and one for civil, which makes sense. So uh, anyway, but it's fun. It's uh, interesting. And uh, my work with the IDC um, and the foundation, uh, when I was president of LCJ, I went to our foundation since they knew me. I said, can I have a few minutes at your next board meeting? He said, sure. And I said, here's what we're trying to do. We want more diversity um, in the appellate bench. Uh, we'd like to start a project and we need $100,000 um, to help give scholarships, uh, et cetera, because a lot of states don't have the money to send their judges. And so they gave us the funds, so $20,000 a year for five years, uh, which allowed us to make proposals to uh, different states and allow uh, minority judges uh, to attend the seminar where maybe they wouldn't otherwise. So that I, was, I, I that do was think good. I know judges who are gone. Good. Um, tell me one of the things that you had mentioned in the materials you supplied me was your um, position as general counsel, Diocese of Nashville, particularly. Um, when the abuse cases started, I think it's 1986. And I thought some of your remarks there were very important and needed to be elaborated on about what the church's responsibility has been and how they're handling A couple of things. My expert early on because I knew nothing about abuse. I'd grown up Catholic, five brothers and three sisters. No idea. No idea. Zero. Zero idea. Never heard of anybody, anything along those lines. Um, and so when it first started to surface, uh, 1986, um, uh, Diocese of uh, Lafayette, Louisiana was a First one that got hit for like a million dollars for notorious abuser down there. Um, we being four to five percent of the population here versus 50 to 60 to 70 percent. We'll you know, talk to them again, let them go to confession, and then you know put them in another parish because these people knew about it. Um, but my expert was Fred Berlin uh, from John Hopkins. Um, and in speaking with him as my expert, says, uh, you know, you have to understand uh, schizophrenia, depression, uh, those sorts of things, lots of people study. He says, but this is such a taboo, undesirable, despicable topic. There hasn't been a lot of research on it. Um, well, the first diocese, I think there have been 28 dioceses now that filed bankruptcy. Uh, out of almost 200 dioceses in the United States. Uh, the first one was the Diocese of Santa Fe, um, where they had a place called the Paracletes. Uh, these were brothers and priests, uh, some of whom were doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, who would take in these priests, uh, treat them almost like alcoholics, um, have them recognize the wrong they did, have them accept responsibility for the wrong they did, and then eventually get them, quote, back into circulation. Well, what would they do? They would, with the blessings of the psychiatrists and the experts, both as members of the paracletes and as members of the medical community in that area, uh, would say, yeah, you know, Father Gino's fine. He can, um, let's try him out a little at a time. So he'd go, you know, at the school for half a day and then come back to the halfway house. Well, needless to say, they began abusing again because they weren't getting the treatments they should have received, et cetera, and so forth. So um, I went to a seminar in 1987 uh, in Chicago. Uh, it was closed door. You had to have ID to get in and out, et cetera. But we had psychiatrists. Uh, we had uh, former victims. Uh, we had former perpetrators, 
Um, and I came back, uh, was Bishop Neuter was that then, and said, this was eye-opening, Bishop, and if we have anybody <laughs> in our diocese that fits this prescription, you need to shoot them. And Bishop Neuter just took copious notes and he wrote, shoot them in about a quarter inch and underlined them several times. Um, and in addition to that, I said, we need to teach uh, and make people aware of this. I said, it's a yucky topic, a yucky subject. Nobody wants to talk about it, but it needs to be talked about. Um, so I got with our kids. Um, Andrea Conti had You Had the Power. Um, Tim Tohill at the Rape and Sexual Abuse Center. And we put together a program called our Safe Environment Program. Uh, where we were teaching at all our schools in 1988, I think was our first year that we began to use it. Um, and hopefully we've done some good. I think we have, not only in most of the abuse from the numbers I've seen, <clears throat> it's not the stranger jumping out from behind the woods. It's 94% family or friends, uh, people, um, teachers, and then, you know, some oh. confidants or, or clergy. And what's most despicable with a clergy um, person doing it is uh, they, you know, wrap themselves in the mantle of Jesus or the Blessed Mother, um, which is one more power uh, play uh, towards uh, some young young person. Um, we started background checks, um, and I remember my first meeting with a, a parish saying, "Here's what we're going to start doing." Uh, was at our Lady Lake in Hendersonville, then, and they said, "Well, what do you think? We're all pedophiles or whatever?" I says, "No, no, this is for your protection." <laughs> so we're doing this to help. Uh, this nobody's accusing anybody of anything. Um, we had DHS come and speak, general counsel every year to all the priests assembled. Uh, we had DCS representatives. Uh, we set up hotlines, um, and thankfully, not wood. Uh, we haven't had a current case um, involving child sexual abuse since uh, 1986. We had a DRE, which is currently in litigation. Uh, I'm sorry, a director of religious education, a layperson um, at one of our uh, rural parishes um, who was involved 10 years ago, 11 years ago, 12 years ago. But as soon as we found out, reported to police, he was investigated. And he's serving uh, 10 years uh, now uh, in, uh, in prison. Um, so, and I've represented other orders. I've represented other dioceses. Um, and it's gotten better. Um, but, you know, one example uh, of meeting with these individuals, uh, the perpetrators, um, I mean, it's a disease. And... You can keep treated criminally or chemically and with therapy, et cetera. Um, but it's uh, it's tragic. And it is, and I think <clears throat> part of what I sense from reading your comments is, one, that has been a big shift from what you were originally doing as counsel for the diocese. Yes, and yes. it's become, um, I think you said that you had helped set up a counseling fund for the victims and for some of the people, you know, just it's a real educational process. Yeah, and that's part of the Our Kids, the Rape and Sexual Abuse Center, now the Sexual Assault Center. In fact, I talked with Rachel Freeman yesterday uh, where someone came from, she's now 68 years old, and uh, she was abused by priests dead 40 years now. Um, back in 1959, um, but she still suffers. Yeah, and we're providing her counseling through uh, Rachel and her group, which is delightful. Uh, so for two family children's services. There, that capacity of general counsel. Yes. 
and you're still actively practicing. Yes. And you are still involved in these organizations that you've mentioned. Yes. Uh, Not as active as I was, but I'm well, um, turning it over to some of those young guys. Because you have a wealth of experience. That's uh, that, as, as one of my priests at Father Ryan said, uh, I'm not as smart as a lot of you guys, but I've been doing this a long time and I've learned a couple of things in that process. So uh, Amen. hopefully that, so that works for some With regards to current activities, those are a few of them. Are there any other current activities that you're involved in? Oh, gosh. Uh, You're not coaching anymore. No, 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 no. My uh, going to soccer games and uh, basketball games and those uh, those sorts of things. Um, it never grows old. No, 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 no. The, the Always God's Children is my campaign now. Uh, I've met with officials of the diocese uh, with a simple question of, what are we doing for the LGBTQ? You know, we have uh, grieving this, we have divorce counseling for this, we've got elderly care for this, we've got children things for this, but I just never hear it discussed. Uh, and what prompted is the Pope, um, uh, Francis, just recently. Uh, scheduled a Senate, you know, let's talk about this. And um, we had probably... 15 different listening sessions at uh, Price of King. Um, and we had 35, 36 comments from parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters on why do we exclude this group of people? Um, and they are made not to feel as though they belong. And, oh, exactly. And well, the 1992, the latest edition of the Catholic Catechism calls it an intrinsic disorder. Um, and so, you know, they don't change the catechism that often. I said, well, you know, that was great. They, I think maybe the American um, um, Psychiatric Association may have had that definition, you know, 40 years ago, but they've changed. Um, so why can't we change as well? I said, you know, we uh, excommunicated Galileo at one time, and then, oh, look, <laughs> the world, oh, right there. Right. we go around the sun and they're vice versa. So um, I'm hoping maybe we'll have that Galileo uh, moment. Um, and some of the representatives I was speaking with said, well, and the, my companion in this, in addition to Jean, my wife, um, is a father of two trans children. Uh, and um, a gay child. Um, and he says, all I want is, I don't want them to say, you know, uh, gay marriage is okay or uh, blessings and this, whatever. I just want them to be accepted for who they are. Um, going through high school, um, one of the big things was God doesn't make junk. Well, that was one of the big signs at all the youth rallies. Um, and God doesn't make junk. So, why are we? Do you feel as though your involvement in that project is making headway? I think it is. I mean, the fact that they met uh, <laughs> to sit down. This is the rector of uh, uh, faith formation and uh, uh, vicar of education. Um, one a priest, one a layperson, PhD. Um, sat and discussed, and we've got another meeting scheduled next week. So the fact that we're we're talking. Um, hopefully is good. Uh, of course, Father Brewer is my pastor at Christ King. Um, one of eight children, raised a Baptist, uh, went to Yale on a music scholarship. While at Yale, fell in love with the Catholic Church, converted, uh, became, um, uh, went to Notre Dame Law School, uh, and uh, then came back and clerked for Judge Drewoda for year and a half, two years, and at the end of that, could have done anything he wanted to, and went to the seminary, and so we knew him when he was in seminary, and now he's been a priest for 35 years, 36 years, African-American, uh, a vicar of general uh, within our diocese, uh, and he's just a delightful, caring person, has run or rollerbladed 75 
marathons. Uh, we went to the Holy Land with them right before COVID. And uh, when you have him saying mass at Cana um, or at the Church of the Annunciation or the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, uh, you know, 10 people that was in our group. And it was just, anyway, he's just a delightful human being. He's absolutely delightful. He's done a session his last uh, three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at six o'clock on the mass and just explaining some, and the church is packed. Um, and one of the questions was, with the prayer of the faithful, uh, the priest read or the uh, lector reads it now or the deacon, but some masses a uh, long time ago, um, they would open it up to the audience. And he says, yeah, but I think uh, that probably wasn't a good idea. For example, I was at Notre Dame, went to Mass, and thought, you know, somebody's sick or somebody's deceased or somebody's passed away or somebody's financial trouble. It says, I'll never forget this one woman says, and for all the bastard children of the Holy Father priest. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you could have heard a pin drop. He says, so, and I thought to myself, so what do we respond to that? You usually say, Lord, hear a prayer. So, <laughs> so I, I said, I can't remember what because I was still, but this woman was dead set earnest uh, in that. So either she or someone close to her had, had that experience. And so, again, nonviolent communication instead of, you know, throwing a rock at this woman, we <laughs> say, I would say that maybe somebody needs project. To yeah, be yeah, yeah. So anyway, Do you have any other projects that you're working on? Oh gosh, that's, that is monumental. Uh, that's 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 my focus, and and being Papa, uh, my grandpa name, uh, my grandfather name. So yeah, I was going to ask you as a closing, well, not close to closing, uh, your retirement, and what do you see as the parameters of your retirement? Funny you should ask that because my children ask it all the time. Um, and I haven't talked to any of them. No, <laughs> my son, uh, Lou, um, after he finished up at uh, Warden, went to work for Vista Equity Partners. Uh, the senior partner there is Robert Smith. And if you look up um, um, Black Billionaires, uh, he's up there. He's a head of Oprah. He's a friend of Michael Jordan. And I think his net worth uh, or something like eight billion dollars. Uh, um, super sharp individual. Um, but Lou worked for them for about fourteen years, uh, and then the culture though had grown. Lou was like hired number thirty-two or thirty-three, um, and now they're over a thousand. And the culture, he said, had changed. Uh, and so he left and he's doing consulting um, and spending more time uh, thinking um, and thinking for me and sending me books uh, uh, about being a player coach. So don't play as much, uh, but coach more. Um, and so I'm trying to do more of that with uh, uh, younger lawyers, uh, those in my firm primarily, instead of me banging away on something, asking them, you know, how I can help them and theirs. Um, and uh, the Always God's Children is, it's uh, six to 10 hours uh, a week. Uh, between learning and studying, because I want to have facts. Uh, so we were talking to Thomas Aquinas Higgins uh, um, earlier. Uh, I was in a motion uh, one day, and I forgot who was on the other side. Um, but after his argument, um, I remember Judge Higgins leaning forward and saying, Mr. Smith? You speak with the authority of one unburdened by the facts. So <laughs> I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm not one of those unburdened by the facts. So uh, uh, I want to make sure I've got my facts and my science uh, uh, correct. So um, so that's, that's primarily it. And uh, spending more time with uh, Jane, uh, we're 
a mile from Percy Warner Park. So we get to walk through there. Uh, last year, Lou, after he left uh, Vista Equity, said, I'd like to uh, take you and mom someplace. I said, I'd love to go see the Cubs play. And Jean said, I'd love to go to Patagonia. <laughs> they don't play in Patagonia. Yeah, I went, go. So anyway, uh, last, about a year ago, uh, end of March, 1st of June, um, Gene and Lou flew to, Patag uh, to Santiago and then down to Patagonia uh, for eight or nine days. And then I flew to Patagonia or to Santiago. Uh, and then Gene came home and Lou and I went to the Atacama Desert uh, which is about two hours north in Chile and for eight days. And we hiked and climbed a 19,000 foot volcano. We only went to 18,600 feet. Uh, two guides, Lewis and I, and uh, uh, just wonderful, wonderful time. But it was just delightful. And uh, so for our 30th or 50th anniversary, we're gonna have a couple of weeks in Italy and uh, just slowing down and doing some walking. I'm not a golfer, um, I haven't played tennis in a while. Um, work out the why as a, where I see you oftentimes and uh, keep doing that and uh, hopefully keep moving and uh, be seen instead of viewed as someone told me the other day. Well, one final question and that is, for new lawyers, young lawyers, what would you advise them as to how to have a successful and rewarding career? I would tell them to care about people. Um, so oftentimes, my complaint about lawyers is, okay, I got another case. Uh, here's what we do, ding, 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 ding. I said, but for your client, this may be the only time they ever see the inside of a courtroom. Maybe the only time they see a lawyer. Uh, this is a scary process. Uh, I tell them, until you give them a deposition where you're on the receiving and being deposed, either as an expert or whatever, I said, it's scary. And so understand that and care about people. Don't ever treat them as just another piece of paper or another file number. Um, and if you look around the world, and that's what it showed me, those countries that are in disarray have no sense of right, wrong, have dictators and what, they have no judicial system. Uh, they have no system of justice. And we are it. I mean, we're the keepers of it. Uh, we're not just a cog in the big machine. We're, we each have a responsibility to keep it, to preserve it, to, um, and not just keep it, but to make it better, um, make it more accessible. I said, rich people don't go to jail uh, very, very rarely. Uh, and when you hear somebody like um, uh, Yusef Salam speak of him being railroaded and what was done to him, and it still happens. Um, it doesn't mean that it happens all the time, but it happens enough uh, that those who are disadvantaged and less fortunate than the privilege we have, I don't care what it is, uh, and we didn't have money growing up at all, but we had a lot of privilege. And one, we had a mom and a dad who were with us all the time, which I think is my biggest treasure ever, ever, ever. Um, and you have caring people now in your families taking care of you. So um, that would be that would be it. And listen, gosh, just listen. <laughs> and really listen. Don't listen saying, okay, I'm getting ready. I know what my response is going to be. I know what you're going to say. So I'm already framing that response before you even say what you're going to say. So anyway, it'll it'll help you and uh, keep you safe as well. Gino, thank you. I think everything that you had to say today was. Um, educational, interesting, and inspiring. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. Thank you.